Hello everybody, uh, I'm Olaf and today we're going to be talking about IDEs. Um, IDEs are, we use them every day and they're incredibly important for our productivity. Uh, but also I think the general knowledge of how they work is quite low. Usually it just doesn't work or it works. And when it works it's amazing because we, we're very productive, we can code a lot, but when it doesn't work it's it's a ruined day so uh, i'm hoping that at the end of this talk that you'll have a bit more understanding maybe of how uh, an ide works uh, and especially how ides in, of the future for the next five ten years will work because i believe we're in in a really exciting area now where the design and architecture of ideas is changing quite a lot so um, brief briefly about me i'm uh, a software developer at the scala center uh, I'm the uh, author and maintain of, uh, maintainer of Scala FMT, Scala Fix, Scala Meta, which are refactoring, reformatting uh, meta programming tools uh, for Scala. And uh, my mission is sort of I, I, I want to enable people to focus on, on building apps, not tools. Because uh, when uh, the tools are really great, we can focus on building better, you know, business applications, etc. I think that's really important and we don't waste much time on. on debating whether we should have a trailing comma or not. So are you familiar with the Scala Center? Some people in the audience, some haven't. So um, we're, an op we're a nonprofit at EPFL, the same uh, corridor where Martin Rodersky's lab is. And our mission is to work on open source and education. Uh, and we maintain the Coursera course uh, on functional programming. And, and uh, we, we do quite a lot of open source and primarily we do tooling. Uh, at the moment, so uh, we just had a talk from uh, Martin and uh, Jorge, my colleagues, in the previous session. So I, s I, I sort of got involved into tooling uh, with Scala FMT, which is a code formatter, over two years ago, and and um, then I then I joined the center to work on Scala Fix, which is pretty much a, almost the same thing. It, it just reads code and then spits out new code, um, and. Um, that's sort of how I got involved into IDEs because I'd been doing formatting and then I'd been doing refactoring and I thought, uh, well, I might as well try and, and, and get involved in doing editor stuff. Um, and I, w I was sort of excited when I saw this uh, comment on Reddit. The Scala ID situation is quite possibly the worst out of all the industrial languages in existence. They're all terrible, especially VS Code or Atom. Just use IntelliJ and hope for the best. So um, I think it's a great quote because partly it's, it's kind of accurate on the recommendation. I think if someone asked me, what do I do with IDs in Scala today? I'd just say, just use IntelliJ. Mm -hmm. But you, know, you may have some issues, but that's definitely by far the best option that you have today. Uh, and I think it's also funny, this, this thing, because it says they're all terrible, especially VS Code or Atom. Uh, because if you ask me, like, how do, where do you see it going in the next two, three years? I think they're actually going to become really, really good and, and contenders. So um, I think it's a fun uh, quote. So I thought, let's build an ID. I mean, come on, how hard can it be? It's, you know, we don't really need IntelliJ. That's sort of heavy. Let's, let's build something more lightweight, something that is fast and snappy. And, and uh, we don't really need so many features, do we? I mean, we just need some basic features. I mean, we, we have our editor, some people have Sublime, some people have Vim. Uh, we have our own build tool, so it should work with SPT, but some people have, have Gradle, some people have Maven. There's a lot of new build tools coming around, so we want it to work with those too. Um, and then we want diagnostics. I mean, we don't want any red squiggles when they're, the program is totally fine. I think everyone has sort of gotten sick and tired of that. Uh, and and, and we, when there are errors, we actually want them to be on the editor too. Uh, so, so, I mean, it's not a tall order, is it? Come on. Um, and to be honest, I think actually you can implement an ID today, like in one day that does just this by writing a regex that scrapes like the console logs and, and puts the diagnosis into the editor. Uh, so I don't really think when people say they mean like I want a lightweight editor, they mean more than this. They mean more than the, just the diagnostics. So um, the pretty basic features, I think, also include, in many people's opinion, uh, go to definition. Uh, and it turns out that 
go to definition is not that uh, small of a feature. It's actually a, a group of features. Uh, you want to browse between your sources and, and you have multiple modules, you have main and test, uh, and then you have dependencies. You want to go into your Scala dependencies, but you also want it to work for your Java dependencies. And, and if you've worked in IntelliJ, you'll notice that when there are no sources, you'll just see decompiled code as well, uh, which is sometimes really helpful. Um, so go to definition is not just one feature, it's actually a group of features. Uh, and according to many people, it's a pretty basic feature. So um, after that, I think the second sort of important feature that you expect is uh, uh, completions. They're a great way to sort of navigate a library, know what you can write next, uh, save a couple keystrokes, etc. Uh, and just like with the definition, uh, completions are not a single feature either. Uh, although they may look like that on the surface. Uh, the thing is, when you complete, you can complete something from the scope. That is, if you're just writing an identifier that's completely uh, brought out, out of the scope. Uh, and But if it's not in scope, we'd expect it to auto-import it from the, from the class path, from our dependencies. Uh, and those are different. Um, and then we also want type members, which is when we do like the dot, and then it lists out the methods that are part of a class. Uh, that's a completely separate feature. Um, and um, uh, sometimes they're not even members of the class, but they are extension methods in Scala. Uh, and those are driven by implicit conversions, which rely on, on fairly advanced sort of language semantics uh, and are difficult to reproduce. Uh, so, um, so completions are also a pretty basic feature. And finally, I mean, not the advanced refactorings, we, but rename it's pretty basic. I mean, I think that... Uh, we can include that in our pretty basic feature list. Um, and organize imports is probably one of the most common things you do in IntelliJ. You want to remove the unused imports. Um, you want to sort them in the in alphabetical order, etc. Um, and then one thing which is sort of common in Scala, it's really nice that it, it, it can help you sort of insert the inferred types um, when you um, when you just have like a large expression, etc. So. Uh, when when we sort of start writing out the, the the checklist for a pretty basic IDE, it's actually maybe not so basic after all, as you can see. So, uh, but in this uh, talk, I'm going to show how we can implement all six of them. And that will be the six steps from zero to IDE. So I'm going to start really quickly by just doing actually a demo um, from a project that's called Metals um, that I started. Uh, uh, last November, when uh, a friend of mine asked me to say, like, hey, I want to get Scala fix into the editor uh, just for linting. He just wanted diagnostics. Uh, and he, he sort of sent me a repo and he said, here's the build, press F5, it'll open up VS Code in debug mode and do your magic. Uh, so that's where we started and, and we got diagnostics, sort of uh, like these ones here, saying stuff that these are not compilers, but they're something that you could configure Scala fix to say, report an error if you use option get, and then uh, VS Code would, would sort of err on that. Um, so um, this is not a published uh, plugin because uh, it's still this sort of prototype uh, status still, but uh, I'm going to show you sort of br briefly what it can do. So here I have opened the project Spire, which is a um, alphanumerical. We actually had to talk about Spire today. Uh, today. And uh, first of all, what we'll notice is that we have the type information on Hoover. And not only just the type, we actually see the full signature information, including the modifiers, et cetera. Um, and then uh, we can go to definition. Uh, and this is for a dependency. This is in Scala check. This is not in the Spire repo. Um, and then we can rename stuff, which is cool. Uh, and I think sort of one thing that is sort of important is definition. It's not only what I've shown you now. It's also being able to tolerate programs that are completely broken. So now I'm just going to start ruining the code a bit. I'm going to do here. I did a bad copy paste. I can still navigate. And I think that's sort of really important. And in fact, you can do it so badly. I think we do it better than IntelliJ uh, because it's a really, really, really fuzzy. Uh, yeah, that one was bad. So. Um <coughs> That's cool. And then uh, also we can jump into Java. Uh, and what's really cool is that we jump into Java and 
now it looks like I've written a Java ID as well. But uh, this is just being handled by the Java language server, so um, uh, it plays out really nicely. So back to here. Um, slow down a bit. Mm. So the agenda of the talk is pretty much a language server protocol, which is the sort of thing that is the spark for a lot of exciting development that's happening right now um, in, in IDEs, also for Scala and many other languages. Um, and um, I'm going to briefly show you the, the, the current zoo of language servers for Scala because there's, it's become so easy to do s some of the things that I just showed you that everyone are sort of experimenting with different approaches. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about the build server protocol, which is uh, a protocol that me and, and my colleagues uh, wrote up because we felt that there were missing parts in the language server protocol. Um, and then I'll wrap up. So um, the language server protocol is sort of inspired by this challenge here. Uh, we want to do IDEs and we want to make them work for every language and every editor. So if you want to do Scala, you'll have to do a custom integration for Vim, for Sublime, for VS Code, and then the next language needs to repeat. Um, and this is, of course, not great, especially because typically people doing editors, they're low on resources, and the ones doing languages are also low on resources. So we want to save work. And uh, the language server protocol is, uh, the idea is that we just specify uh, the communication protocol between an editor and the language server. And then you can just implement it once. So uh, Vim implements a language server protocol client, then Scala implements a server, um, and then for Sublime, and then you can reuse the same server for the same for different editors. Um, and, and this is completely, it started maybe two, three years ago, and, and now it's totally exploded. There are language servers for over 30 languages and, and all of the major editors. Uh, there's even work to do both clients for IntelliJ and also servers because you can use IntelliJ. So there's a lot of activity ongoing right now. And um, the, the, the architecture is that uh, the editor sends uh, requests to servers you can have multiple servers running. Uh, you saw in my demo, I was jumping to Java, uh, which then I was able to browse the Java code with definition. Uh, so then essentially it was in my Scala file, came back and then it browsed to the Java server. And it's so seamless, it, it's so natural when you try it in the editor. It's almost magical when you think that like all of the infrastructure that's ongoing behind the scenes. Um, and underneath, sort of on the wire, uh, it's just sending JSON RPC messages back and forth on practically every keystroke. And then you're thinking, now I know why VS Code is so slow. It's just sending huge amounts of JSON blobs back and forth all the time. Um, turns out this is just completely false. Uh, it's absolutely negligible, the overhead of, of sending these messages back and forth on every single keystroke. Um, there's a guy at Google who's, who's doing uh, writing Fuchsia, an oper operating system. And, and in his spare time, he's working on an editor called Xi, uh, which is an editor for the next 20 years with uncompromising performance. Uh, and uh, the, the, the architecture, he says, that he believes for the future of editors uh, is totally different than the architecture for editors in the past. Uh, and he believes that it should be sort of client-server architecture. The core does not even have a GUI, uh, and, and the client should provide the GUI. And uh, between the core and the front end, you communicate via JSON RPC, uh, which is just a, the same architecture uh, as LSP. So uh, I, I feel like maybe in 10 years from now, there will be just 10 layers of, of servers and protocols talking back and forth all the way up, uh, which is brilliant because you can write the core editor in Rust and a language server in Scala, and everything just communicates and interoperates really nicely. Um, and this guy, he, he, he promised uncompromising performance, so he profiled and traced very accurately down what the overhead of each step in this pipeline is. And it turns out that JSON parse is microseconds here. Or something. It's, it's completely negligible. And it turns out that like rendering text is slower. Uh, so, so he started optimizing how to render text with OpenGL and stuff like that. So uh, I think it sort of tests our intuition of what is fast and what is slow. Uh, IDs are sort of exciting because they, they definitely, they're, they're st they stress latent latency and, and, and it's, it's not always intuitive what is important or what is hard or what is slow, etc. Um, 
So this was me back in November. I, I, I was sort of reading up online, trying out other language servers, and I thought, that, wow, this is, we're gonna have such an amazing future, man. And, uh, and I was like, how do I sign up? I'm gonna do uh, an LSP language server. Um, So um, in in, th in practice, I feel that this is sort of it. Uh, LSP is amazing. Like, don't get me wrong. It's 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 definitely the building block that is making it so. It's it's lowered the barrier of entry so much for doing IDs, incredibly. But there's still a huge amount of work to do. Um, so uh, the rest of the talk, I'm practically gonna show you a bit more, like why the owl is kind of difficult to draw um, by going through each of the methods in LSP, sort of the core. Uh, protocol messages, uh, explain then the architecture, how I've implemented them in metals. Um, and then you'll maybe see that all of the different components that need to play together to make this work. So beware, there's going to be quite a few sequence diagrams, but I'll try to keep it uh, light. So the primary one is uh, published diagnostics. We want to set red diagnostics as we type. Um, this is like a, a very basic feature. It's the simplest sort of obvious feature that you'd like to have, um, but it's very hard if you want. So you, you have this endless bait between a challenge between trading off correctness and latency. You sort of want to get the diagnostics right away as you type, but you don't want them ever to be wrong. Uh, so one common way to do it is to use the, the compiler. You depend on it as a library and then run it on the buffer without before you save all the time. Uh, and this is the mode where I, I will be using the word presentation compiler. Um, so I'm, I've tried it and I've, I've integrated with it and, and I felt that it was sort of difficult to get it working for large builds, multiple modules, uh, longer running sessions. So the, the architecture I personally believe is the way forward to do accurate diagnostics. They're always in sync with your build. Uh, that's just to do it in the build. Uh, and then what we have here is then uh, uh, to only trigger it as you save the file, which may feel maybe uh, annoying if you're used to working in IntelliJ, you get it as you type. Um, if you like that, then you can use IntelliJ. Uh, I think that's fine. But I think for, for having completely accurate, and it's sort of nice that you control when type checking occurs, you do it on save. Um, and so what happens here is that SPT implements its own server that also speaks JSON RPC. Uh, with its own custom method called SPT exec. So it's pretty cool. Metals can, uh, as you save, it sends a JSON RPC to the build tool, um, asking for a request uh, to compile, uh, and then um, SPT publishes the diagnostics back and forth. So um, I think this is working really well. Uh, I'm really excited about SPT servers. So if you're still on 013, I recommend you upgrade. Um, the next one that we wanted to solve was definition, right? That's a pretty basic feature. So um, in the GIF here, we see quite a few things happening. There we go and jump to a local symbol inside of the block. And there we're jumping into Java dependency. And there we go into a Scala dependency. Um, so what is the sort of, how do we deliver this thing um, robustly? Um, and that's a bit more involved than uh, the diagnostics. Uh, and it involves this absolutely tedious and horribly slow process that we all dread uh, in IntelliJ is that we sort of have to index. If we want to be able to provide definition that's fast in milliseconds, we sort of need to know all of your dependencies and know their locations of this, uh, the global, global methods and classes, etc. So uh, when you import the project, uh, and this happens when you open up VS Code in a project, it'll do an initialized handshake with the server. Uh, this triggers the server to talk to the build, query for some uh, metadata, such as dependencies, uh, which will it'll return back with like a list of, of sources jars that we can then feed into an index. Uh, and then the index that does its work, and this is while your CPU is choking and, and, and the, the fan is spinning. Uh, and then once it's complete, uh, you can do definition requests and then the index can pretty much just respond it pretty fastly. Um, I think that we need an index. There's different, uh, this is not completely agreed upon, but uh, that some people want to do more on demand. Uh, but I feel like it's, if you do definition, you don't expect that to start type checking 
bunch of stuff and responding two seconds later uh, and even if a second is too slow so if you want to do that really fast millisecond response times then you sort of have to know the answer before the user asks for it um, and in metals i use semantic db which is uh, an interchange it's a schema protobuf schema uh, that includes a bunch of semantic information about source code that is produced when you compile an SBT. It produces these files that are essentially is a, a list of, of uh, objects that are shaped like this. They'll say there's a string, which is a symbol uh, in this line number and, and the column. I have a reference to that particular symbol. So this is something that the, the build produces as you compile. Uh, and the, the server just picks up these files and, and uses them to respond. Uh, and then what's really neat, as you saw when I was re removing code, editing it and, and breaking it, uh, we can, Metals is able to do really well, is to recover from, you know, make the most of an old snapshot, uh, uh, which in my experience is turning out to be really, really good. It's almost better than what we have in IntelliJ. Um, so um, that was diagnostic. No, go to definition. Um, now we're on to completions. Uh, and, and there's quite a lot of stuff happening here. Um, first of all, we see we do a scope lookup. Uh, and when we complete it, a refactoring happens. It inserts an import right there. Um, and then when we complete it, we do a dot, and now we query for a member. So it's so seamless. It's something that you wouldn't even think about being hard. There's quite a lot of moving pieces here. There's quite a lot of stuff. Uh, so how does this work? Um, as you can imagine, there's going to be a sequence diagram, and it's quite a big. <laughs> uh, so the editor starts by doing a completion, um, and that's the first one, uh, which turns out that because it's not inside of the scope, we we query we have to query the index, which knows our dependencies. Uh, and the index supports fuzzy searching because we can see it's like comp pro, uh, and that. Uh, works for completion provider. So the index uh, responds with that, uh, but it's attached with a meaning that we have to refactor as well. So what's really neat is that uh, LSP supports uh, a fairly advanced re completion API, which allows you to give a list of suggestions first. And then before, when you select one, the editor goes back and says, hey, do you want to do more with this particular item? Uh, and that's called a uh, completion item resolve uh, we're in metals, we can then say, okay, great. Well, you, you chose this uh, suggestion. Uh, this one will need an import. So uh, it can query Scala fix and say, hey, can you pr produce the text edits? Like what are the removals in which lines and columns to refactor the code to include this import? Um, and then we go back. So that is what happens in the first sort of second right there. A lot of stuff. Um, but then as soon as we do a dot, uh, the editor does another another completion request, which we then pass on to the, the Scala compiler uh, because that's a member lookup and that's pretty hard to do. Um, uh, so that's where the presentation compiler is used and it responds and, and there we go. So uh, next time when you go into IntelliJ and start typing all of these things, it's sort of mind blowing to think about all of uh, IntelliJ of course has a completely different architecture, but there's quite a lot of stuff going on. Um, uh, the final thing we're done soon uh, with the diagrams is the code actions. We wanted to have pretty basic refactoring support. Uh, and here we see a demo of sort of remove the unused imports. Uh, and this is the, the warnings are published by the compiler. So it says these are unused. We know that they're completely accurate. I think in IntelliJ, I've found, found that the organized imports refactoring is kind of broken if you happen to have an import that is picked up by a macro expansion or implicit conversion or and it's something you pretty much do all the time maybe hundreds of times a day <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah this should i've run it on Aka Aka. i should send that pr by the way because i removed like 500 lines of code uh, and and it all compiled afterwards um, and um, so this is triggered by the warnings from the actual compiler. So if your SPT build complains unused warning, uh, this is what Metals essentially acts on. Um, and um, uh, so what we see here is that there's a warning, and then we go over it, and there's a light bulb, and then we 
press that action and you don't have to click with your mouse you can also uh, do it with uh, shortcuts so I sort of cut out the big piece here because the, this is the most interesting thing is to show the amount of back and forth going back just to deliver this user experience um, what we have is there's a change in the file then we publish the diagnostics from the compiler um, what then happens is that as you go over a diagnostic the editor sends a code action request uh, which is to say, what actions can I do at this location right here? So then we get also the range of where you are. Um, we respond saying, these are the actions you could do. So in this case, it's just like, oh, you're above a re uh, like an unused warning import, unused import warning. You can un remove unused imports, but you don't have to do any refactoring. We just say, that's what you could do. And well, if you're going to do it, send me back this JSON blob. And then we just give it like a JSON payload to, to send us back later. Uh, then when once we click it, the, the, the editor um, uses the workspace execute command request, which is part of LSP, uh, and includes the payload that we requested be previously. And, and uh, uh, then what happens is that this is sort of an any to unit uh, function. It just sends us a JSON payload, and then it says, I don't care what you respond with, but just do something. You know, write to disk or whatever. Um, and what we do here is is we use an LSP feature, which is called Workspace Apply Edit. The, the editor is able to, no, the server is able to invoke a refactoring for the whole workspace, different files that even if you don't have them open. Um, and uh, then the editor responds saying true or false, uh, I managed to complete the refactoring, and then we respond with the execute command saying unit. Um, and I think what's interesting with this diagram is that client server is a total lie because the server is initiating requests to the client here. So it's uh, LSP is really not a client-server architecture. It's just a bi-direction, peer-to-peer protocol to send messages back and forth. And you can initiate notifications from the server to the client, and you can send from the client to the server. Um, so that, that was sort of mind-blowing. I didn't realize it until like two, two months into the project. I'm like, whoa, uh, client-server is just such a lie. Um, so enough with the sequence diagrams and let's just relax a bit and look at this silicone uh, become dark if you want to color silicone. Any questions? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, do we have problems with network latency for these requests? Um, uh, in my experiences, personally, just like intuitively, no. Uh, and um, as as the, the the guy who was working on she, the editor, was measuring and tracing the whole pipeline, it's totally negligible in terms of the architecture-wise. It's not uh, the latency can be high if your language server is slow. So I mean, if you're you're trying to do a completion and you're type checking the code, uh, that that can have a, a lot of latency, right? But uh, fundamentally, the the pipeline is is not the overhead. Uh, it's it's snappy, because I mean, you have maybe 20, 30 milliseconds, which is a very long time to to do a lot of back and forth. Um, all right. Well, hope you enjoyed the silicone GIF. I promise that I'd explain now the current zoo of efforts in, in, in Scala. So as you can imagine, we have this architecture, we have the methods the messages. And so it's sort of pl not plug and play, but it, the, it, there's you, you go in and it's like, these are the things you can do. And then you just implement them and then you get like an awesome editor for free, uh, which is really rewarding. It's honestly one of the most fun projects I've, I've, I've done in a while. Um, so what has happened is a lot of people are, are doing this as well and they're playing with different architectures they want to do navigation that way, or they want to do completions that way, et cetera, et cetera. So this is my, I'm going to show you like a table. Uh, and it's my personal sort of biased view on, on the state of the world. But you should maybe ask and talk to people if you want more details. And also one thing, because I got comments on it I've, uh, before, this is not, I'd, I'd say these are all super complementary, and, and there's a huge amount, there's a lot of collaboration between everyone involved. There's 
not less competition in my experience than it's more that people are actually just experimenting with different things and there are technically different uh, approaches so um uh, primarily, I'd say that there are four sort of different uh, experiments I'm going now to do uh, LSP with Scala. So if you go to the marketplace, I think you'll find VS Code marketplace, you'll find maybe five different s servers because there are two for Enzyme uh, or, and there's none for metals because um, I haven't published it. But uh, Enzyme has its own graph apocalypse implementation for a symbol index that is based on, on class files and, and, and uh, some other uh, s tricks. Uh, and then uh, in Dottie that we saw yesterday, Tasty is this interchange format for types abstract syntax trees that are produced by the compiler, which is uh, working in Dottie. Um, and um, they're able to provide navigation within your project sources because those are compiled with Dottie. Uh, and, and actually, um, so that's why I sort of say partial support because uh, if your dependencies are in Java, well, the Java compiler does not emit Tasty. So you need something there to fill in the hole. Uh, so it's technically doable, but uh, you, you got to be able to work with uh, whatever exists on Maven. Um, and then SBT has uh, an, a language server that you can use, which is built on the Zinc analysis file. So Zinc is the incremental compiler. And while doing... Um, incremental compilation, it does emit tiny amounts of, of metadata that can be used for navigating uh, between source files, but it's kind of constrained. It only works well for your project that you're compiling, and, and it also does not even work for all of the symbols in your project. It works for some classes, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you might find that there's going to be quite a lot of hit and misses uh, if you're navigating. Um, so that's why I also added partial support. And then in, in in metals, we use semantic DB, which is the format that I just showed uh, earlier, um, which is the the same data that Scalafix needs. So Scalafix does not depend on the Scala compiler; it only depends on semantic DB. So by using that, we can both power the navigation index and we get sort of refactoring for free, um, which is really awesome. Um, it, it sort of started that we wanted to do linting only. And, but then we had to set up the semantic DB integration. I was like, well, at this point, I might as well do go to definition, right? Um, and, but for the diagnostics, as I said, we've done some experiments to do use both the, um, the SPT server to do compile and then Scala C, uh, the presentation compiler. Uh, so if I were to bet, put my money on it, I'd, I'd say that I think the, the route of using the compiler to, comp to publish, no, the build to publish the diagnostics, I think is better. Uh, but it may definitely be slow for large projects, which is not desirable, of course. Um, then they're using the, the Scala presentation compiler, the Dari presentation compiler, and Enzyme has the um, Scala refactoring library, which is the same one that Scala ID uses in Eclipse, which is a fairly old project. So um, we sort of forgot one thing, a pretty basic feature that I have not talked about at all. Uh, which is a limitation of the language server protocol, which is the fact that I wanted to work with my build tool. I've so far shown you s only something that works with SPT. And does anyone here work in Maven? Two people, no more. Uh, Gradle, more people. And uh, anything else than SPT as well? Some hands. So we also care about you. And. Uh, there are quite many. I think I'm, I'm very excited about some of the new ones that are coming. And I'm also excited, I think, about Bazel, uh, if you have uh, heterogeneous code base, et cetera. So we want to cater. You know, The ID should not be tied to SPT. So um, whoa, that was not. So the situation that we have is essentially that, well, for every ID, you sort of have to implement a build integration. It's not that hard, but it's quite a lot of work if you got to do it right to export the build metadata, the dependencies between the modules, etc. Uh, so in IntelliJ, they've done essentially checked all of the boxes for all of the languages, and 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 their uh, uh, and in an Enzyme has existed for, existed for quite a while. So uh, they have integrations with Maven, Gradle, Pants, um, but but uh, and then also for new uh, build tools, they sort of just hard code and they implement as an integration for IntelliJ because they only care about IntelliJ, but that sort of makes it hard for newcomers to come into uh, and, and come with a new language server. Um, 
so this is sort of the state of the art and and um this was the situation that we were facing in january and we were thinking wait a second this looks a bit familiar has anyone seen this table before why don't we just do a build server protocol so uh uh, we, we sat down and we wrote uh, sort of a document, a wish list of what, what would be awesome if we could just communicate with the build tool through JSON or PC. And it would give us all of this information that we're, you know, going through pain to write SPT plugins and then get people to install it in globally, et cetera. It's like, why doesn't just SPT provide it to us? Like, that's, this is what we need. And it's actually not complicated data. So um, we sat down, we wrote it, and then sort of, fishing, hoping that someone would pick it up and implement it. Uh, but it turns out that, uh, so uh, Jorge, my colleague at the center, and they just had a presentation in the previous session about Bloop, uh, joined efforts with the JetBrain, the IntelliJ Scala team, um, to do a build server integration. So that <coughs> the, um, and they had a really awesome presentation about it uh, a month ago at ScalaSphere. Uh, and it's really exciting for IntelliJ because it allows you to have much faster import build imports. Uh, and as you save, you can just trigger compilation in the build tool natively in the build tool and get those diagnostics directly. And it's also important for IntelliJ to get those um, or maybe just faster reload, getting updated dependencies, etc. cetera. Uh, so uh, I won't go into depth, but I do recommend checking out this talk, uh, build server protocol and fresh ideas with uh, from Jorge and, and Justin uh, about a month ago or come and talk to them or me so um, we're gonna wrap it up I think we had six features from zero to IDE the pretty basic uh, six steps from zero to pretty basic ID because uh, there's a whole category of features that people use debugging um, way more of these uh, I don't know what people use in IntelliJ, but it's quite a lot. Uh, but we're just doing the basic stuff. So I um, wanted to work with my editor, and I think uh, LSP is amazing. It definitely sort of checks that box. And uh, it's, uh, it seems insignificant in this long list, but it's a huge problem. And it's something that has existed for decades like as a problem. And it's only, it's only now that it's become so easy, uh, which is exciting. Um, and then I wanted to work with my build tool. Uh, well, I think BSP is a pretty exciting uh, avenue here, uh, and I'm hoping that it can be picked up more by more build tools. Uh, I definitely, for me, the next steps for me in Metals would be to implement a, a client, uh, and then just say, this is the interface that we require, uh, because I've found it really hard to be doing only SPT plugin work. And then someone says, does it work in Maven? <laughs> and then, then you have to just repeat the work. And I think the combination of these two uh, to, to trigger compilation, because LSP does not have a way to say, compile this module. Uh, it has a way to like let the server send notifications, hey, here's a compilation error, but you're not able to sort of like trigger compilation. Um, and the combination of these two, so LSP provides the infrastructure to say, publish diagnostics, give me red diagnostics. Uh, and it can say, hey, I just saved the file. Uh, but the combination of them, you can get sort of on save, get pretty fast feedback with the, 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 the red errors. Um, my biased opinion, I think SemanticDB is pretty great for navigation because as you saw, it works great if even if you have broken code, if you copy pasted something, it's still sort of the old stuff works. Or if you just checked out a branch, you know, most code doesn't change. So then it can just Im instantly browse. Or if you have Git merges, it still sort of handles this stuff even if the code does not parse at all. Uh, and I think that's a pretty important feature. Uh, but then again, also, also it's accurate. It's ex it matches exactly what the compiler produces. So if, even if you're using advanced type level machinery, it'll give you the correct uh, definitions. Um, and um, for the completions, I have no clue. <laughs> uh, it sort of requires custom work, in my opinion. I'm, I'm sort of not convinced that it's uh, possible to, to uh, it would require a lot of work to get the presentation compiler using as a, the compiler as a library to be up to date with your build. So just to give you one example that I think is important, but is really hard to do with the compiler is you have main and test, you just write a new class in, in main, then you want to complete it in test. 
these are two different modules, they're different class paths, they're different compiler instances, and they need to be aware of the symbols in the other ones. Uh, so I found that if you want to do this, well, I think uh, Dottie has a, a better um, architecture for, for being a presentation compiler. So I, I'm, I'm excited about that. Uh, but for working with, if you're doing Spark, you're on 2.11, uh, I have a feeling that maybe it might be worth to try to do just a custom completion engine. That's what, for example, the Rust language server does not use the Rust compiler to do completions. It's actually a custom implementation uh, because also what you saw from the examples, it's way more than just what the compiler does. You want auto import, you want, you know, um, you want to query the index, et cetera, uh, which are not things that the compiler provides out of the box. So for me, this is still sort of a clue. So um, I guess I kind of lied on the title. Um, and for refactoring, well, uh, I think Scalafix has a pretty good integration to be used as a library. It can give you very fine-grained text patches to only touch the parts of the code that uh, it's refactoring, uh, which allows the old diagnostics and other stuff to, to live in the editor. And you can apply and compose more um, multiple different rules together in one batch. And, and I think what's really important is that you can, um, as a, uh, an API that I have not talked about at all, but you can very easily extend Scalafix with custom rules without being tied to the compiler in any way. And it has a really great testing infrastructure to test new rules. Uh, so this is sort of work that I've been doing for two years and, and I'd like to advertise it as a, as a pretty compelling uh, building block to do refactoring. So uh, that'll be it for me. Um, thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, Olaf. Are there any questions now? Hi, uh, how does this help us with debugging? So um, there is a, you can guess it, debug server protocol. Um, awesome. <laughs> Uh, and in fact, uh, Guillaume Martre, who's speaking also uh, at this conference, will be having a demo with debugging in, in VS Code with Dottie, uh, and it's pretty awesome. So I'll delegate that to him. Yeah. Hi. Um, so how much are you talking with the Dottie, Dottie guys uh, to sort of plan ahead and converge to um, some common implementation across things? So, I mean, uh, I'm in the same quarter as they are and we eat lunch practically every day. Um, there's a lot of collaboration. Uh, we do have meetings and well, we have our disagreements and agreements. Uh, I think they have as a presentation compiler something pretty exciting. Uh, and I think for navigation, we have something better uh, in metals. Um, so, as I see them being complementary, but it's uh, you can't force people to just work in exactly in the same repo. Um, there's also issues. They have a bootstrapping requirement, so they cannot pull in Scala dependencies. Um, but in Metals, I use Monix because it has a cancelable task. And when you're doing completion, you get cancellation requests. Um, so as you can imagine, there's just a whole bunch of stuff that... Um, but And then I'm speaking a lot with Sam Halliday. Uh, back and forth. He's very excited about SemanticDB. Um, and then, well, I also frequently talk with the SPT guys. So it's very, people are on a technical debate discussing trade-offs. Uh, the only thing I can complain about or wish for is just that we'd had maybe a couple of million dollars to fund, fund this effort uh, because currently it's relied on, on quite a lot of volunteer effort. Um, mm. That's another question. And maybe a very obvious question, but how do I try this out? Uh, we have a website, actually. Um, actually, we have a really awesome domain called metals.rocks, <laughs> which opens up the website. Uh, and you can go to the user installation. It'll tell you, ah, there's nothing to see here. Uh, it's still under active development, so uh, if you want to contribute, you can head over to the contributor documentation, which shows you how to set up sort of as a contributor. You can build uh, the plugin yourself. Uh, some of the guys are using it for day-to-day -day work, but uh, it's um, the navigation part is working pretty well. Uh, but you can you can go there and try. 
Is this also coming to Vin or Neo Vin? So some people have managed. We have you can go to uh, integrating with the new editor, and uh, Felix, who's in the room, is using it with Vim. But there were some challenges with file watching. Um, but he's in the room. You can ask him. But uh, the Vim client is sort of primitive. It doesn't. So we use some of the more advanced features of the LSP, like file watching, notifications, and um, if the editor doesn't send us the file watching notifications, well, then we don't know about the index updates, etc. So uh, by far, I'd say Atom and VS Code are the ones who are uh, most stable. Any more questions? Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much again. Bye-bye.